Um, we've been going through this baggage series, but um, I have not come with much offering in the way of a joke, and I've done some different things, so I want to try again this morning with a, something really special just for you guys. <laughs> so, found a story. Found a story about a couple adventurers that were traveling around the world and they ended up camping together in the heart of the African jungle. And uh, this kind of caught my eye. I mean, not only baggage and travel and stuff, but we're going to Kenya next year, a, a team. And so these two guys are sitting there discussing their journeys and so on in, in, the, in their camp in the middle of the African jungle one evening. And one of them asked the other, said, so, um, you know, why did you begin this adventure? And the man says, well, I, I came because I just had this urge to travel. It was just like boiling in my blood. The city life was boring me. I was tired of exhaust fumes and the highways were just making me sick. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to see a sunrise over the African mountains. I wanted to hear the birds flying over my head. I wanted to experience things, me and, against, me and nature, uh, like, like God intended. I wanted to leave fresh footprints in the sand as I walked along the beaches and, and, and I just knew I had to, to, to launch out and meet nature in its rawest form. What about you? What started your adventure? And the second man said, well, it was because my son started to learn to play the saxophone. <laughs> Not quite as noble and as inspiring, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Well, we have been going through this series on baggage, looking at the king, uh, Saul, that was anointed to take over uh, his royal position, leading the nation of Israel. And he's ever since, throughout the generations, for thousands now, thousands of years, he's been known as the worst king that Israel's ever had. And we've been asking the question, why? What was the problem? Where was it coming from? What was it? And we've been learning some things about, about him and, and, and about his story. And what we saw, and I had to go back and dig this out. We've been kind of going through some of the chapters. What did we come up with, Annie? It was chapter 9 or 10? To chapter 10? I think chapter 10. It's on the board. It's on the board down there. Chapter 10 was coronation day in front of the entire nation of Israel. They call, they call Saul to come up and take his crown as the king and be anointed as a king in front of everybody. And, and, and as you know, we've said, he didn't show up. Where was he? Well, the, the, the one text says that he was hiding in the baggage. Others say it was the supplies, but as they camped out and they had a pile of supplies laying there, Hall, uh, Saul was hiding down inside of this baggage. And God told Samuel, the prophet, where he was. They had to get a group of men to go find him and actually drag him out from it to take this spot as the king. And what happens is, is then, from then on out, Saul continues to lead out of insecurity and out of fear um, and, and out, out of just his, uh, his sense that he could not step into the position that God had given him. He couldn't become the person God intended or, or op gave him the opportunity to become because he never really comes out from his baggage. And what a metaphor for us. How many of us struggle becoming the person of faith, the person of courage, the, the person of spiritual health because we're still stuck hiding inside of our baggage. The stuff of our lives, whether it's from our past or whether it's the stuff that we deal with each and every day that keeps us from becoming the people that God is calling us to be. And so we've been unpacking this a little bit and we recognize, first of all, that we all have baggage. Everybody does. Everybody's got stuff. You've all, you, have a, you have a past. You have hurts and pains. You've got experiences. You have stress to deal with. You've, you've made mistakes. You have frustrations and, and disappointments and anger. We all deal with this kinds of stuff. Life never goes smooth. Life never goes perfectly. And so how are we going to deal with that? Well, first we have to, we, re we recognize that we all have baggage. And second of all, to deal with that baggage, we need to admit that we need help. 
I think a lot of us tend to believe that if we just keep going in life, it'll get better. If we just ignore it, if we just pretend it's not there, if we just keep going, I can get better. Life will get better. Things will start to work out. In reality, we need to admit that we need help. And, and the Bible tells us it comes from God. And it also comes from important friendships in our life. People that we can go to and try to unpack some of that baggage. Then the next week, we kind of took a, a bit of a turn and just talked about how we can use music's power to experience God. That as we're dealing with our baggage, as we're dealing with our stuff, we noticed how this did bring some comfort to Saul. Music was a way to alleviate the torment that he was going through. Problem is he eventually rejects it. But in that moment and in that story, in that experience, we saw that God's intention is for us to come before him and experience him in a way that, that nothing else can really provide. And, and that there's a power in music as we're trying to experience God and find the courage to deal with things in our lives. Now last week then we looked at how it's time to take action. And we could probably talk about that topic every week until Jesus returns. Because the problem is, is that baggage and problems in our lives have a tendency to paralyze us, to immobilize us, to cause us not to press in or move in towards our problems, but instead to ignore them and, and to retreat. So we looked, at, we looked at how Israelite is standing there in front of the Philistines and they're afraid of Goliath and so they just run away. Instead of moving into a, the call of action from God to take up their spot, their position, their, their place of strength in that area. And Saul was leading the charge of fear and running away. It's not good when the king's the first one to run. <laughs> it's not good when the leader is the source of the problem. And we talked about how all of us, though, we lead in some area in our life. All of us have influence. Leadership is just influence. And whether you, uh, you influence an entire army or maybe just your family, you have leadership. And how you live your life in fear or, or courage, uh, in, in, in faith or in insecurities, it impacts those who are around you. And so we have to take action to deal with our baggage. We have to do something. So this week, we want to talk about discovering your baggage. What is it? What are the things? And, and as, I was gonna, as I was going through this, I, I, an interesting piece of the story just kind of jumped out at me, and I want to look at it um, and, and break this into two parts. So this week, we're going to talk about how we need to discover our baggage, which is kind of the same thing we've been saying all along, but we're going to unpack that a little further and then next week, we'll talk about how. So uh, make sure you're here for next week as well. Um, so discovering your baggage. When we left our story last week, Saul and the Israelite army had been facing off against the Philistine army. And all the Israelites are lined up on one side of a hill. And all the Philistines are lined up on a different side, on the other side of the hill. There's a valley in between them. And every morning and evening for 40 days... They would line up and this giant, this Goliath, would come out into the middle of the battlefield. He'd begin taunting them. He would uh, yell at the Israelites. He would try to strike fear in their hearts and then challenge them to send a champion down to do battle. But they wouldn't engage the battle. Instead, they would just all run away from fear. One guy walks out on the field and the entire army runs. Well, David, the younger brother of some of the men in the army... He's come out to visit his brothers. His father had sent them, sent him with some food and supplies and said, go and take this to your brothers and check on them, tell, uh, see how everything's going, going. And when he arrives, David becomes witness to these events. He, he, he finds out when he gets there, they've already lined up. And so he runs out to, to the battlefield to see what's happening. And, and he witnesses this thing where they all turn and run away and go back to camp. And so it's later that night, David is walking through the camp, talking to people, finding out, trying to find out what's going on. 
he's in the Israelite camp and he's just listening to what they're saying. He's asking a couple of questions about what's going on and, and, uh, and interacting with the other soldiers to see what's happening. And as he listens to them, he discovers two things. First of all, the, the, the Israelite soldiers don't really know how to defeat Goliath. The fear remains. I mean, they walk out every morning trying to be courageous, trying to feel like they're going to deal with this problem, but they really don't know what to do. And the second thing is, uh, the, the king has offered a great reward for anybody who is finally willing to go out and face Goliath. And he's offering money. He's offering uh, one of his daughters in the hand of marriage. And he's even offering that, th that your entire family would not have to pay taxes to Israelite for the rest of their lives. Now there's an incentive. <laughs> and so he hears that and he hears what's going on. And then one of his brothers finds or kind of sees David walking through the camp. And I want to look at that encounter in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 26 and 28. We're just going to look at a small portion of this story today. 1 Samuel 17 26 through 28 and this is David is walking through the camp at night and it says this David asked the men standing near him what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, they repeated to him what they had already been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. And it's the reward I just mentioned. Then Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, and he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Why did you leave your responsibilities at home? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now let's consider how David's older brother Eliab burned with anger. That's the phrase that kind of caught my attention this week as I was considering it. Eliab burned with anger. And I just thought it was interesting, again, as I considered this through the lenses of baggage, as I thought about it, looking at how Saul and the Israelites and so many people in this story um, are, are de making decisions and doing things out of their insecurities and fears. And I asked, my question, asked myself the question, what had David done wrong? I know what his brother accuses him of. He accuses him of leaving behind his responsibilities at home. He accuses him of, of having an evil heart and just wanting to come out and watch the battle, watch the blood, you know, re report what's going on. He accuses him of these kinds of things. But in reality, what had David done wrong? What could possibly have inc incurred this wrath from his brother? Well, really, nothing. Nothing had really happened. He was just talking with the soldiers. He was involved in the same conversation that everyone else was having throughout the camp. He's just asking a couple questions. He did display his faith in God. He did say, as they said, this Israel, this uh, comes out and defies uh, the Israelite armies. And David kind of clarifies that and says, no, he defies the armies of the living God. So he, all he really does is declare his faith and engage in the exact same conversation that everyone else is having. So why does this older brother get angry and why does he get so angry? Because he's not just annoyed by a pest, you know, his pest little brother. He's not just disappointed or frustrated and it's not even normal anger, whatever he's angry at. I just find it interesting that the text said he burned with anger. This is a kind of, uh, of outrage with little Davy here where smoke is coming out of his ears. His eyes turn red and the flames are shooting. I mean, he burned with anger, it says. And so what do we see that's going on? What is really happening? And I would suggest to you that as the armies felt defeated and powerless against Goliath 
as their courage is gone, as their faith is gone, as their masculinity has been neutered by this, this utterly uh, insurmountable problem, they feel completely and fully defeated. They feel like they have, they have you know, let their families down. They have let their king down. They have let their nation down. They have let their God down. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to move forward. We don't know how to handle this problem. We are just utterly lost. And so Eliab turns this perceived threat of the enemy towards a different enemy that he can overcome or feels he can. Because he, it seems to me that because he feels threatened, he feels, uh, the, the, the army feels uh, overpowered over here, he burns with anger against David because maybe he can take control of something else, someone else in his life. He feels defeated by Goliath so surely he can whip up on his little brother. And it always rolls downhill, doesn't it? It's interesting what your baggage will cause you to do. I read a story this week about a young man. He was looking for advice because he st felt stuck in a pattern of, uh, he called it freezing up. Every time he walked into a situation where he felt uh, confronted or threatened unfairly. You know, whether it was uh, at, at work or in his community or with his family or with friends, he just felt like if anybody said anything that challenged him, he would freeze up and not know how to respond. And, and this was how he described it. He says, it's like I freeze and just let it pass. Then I privately brood about it later. I can't feel angry very much when I'm around others, but later when I'm alone. The anger floods in and I beat myself up for not standing my ground when the event actually happened. I ruminate, how dare he say that? And then I'm utterly lost in my self-loathing. He later goes on to discover and, 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 uh, and, and talks with some others to help him figure out some of this. What he realizes is he's dealing with some deferred anger. A lot like Eliab and uh, uh, David. And he recognizes that his deferred anger is really tethered to his past because he grew up and experienced an abusive father. And because his mother and he were victims of physical abuse and really severe physical abuse growing up, now later in his adult life, conflict and confrontation was still paralyzing him. He never learned how to deal with it. And so anytime he walked into a difficult situation, it would cause him to freeze up. Um, I know of a pastor that um, always did a good job of telling his wife his schedule, where he was, when he would be home, where he was going, and he tried to give that to her all the time. However, one particular night at the church, he was in a, uh, uh, an unexpectedly long and difficult meeting with some of the, the leaders of the church and it made him about 15-20 minutes late getting out of the office and he decided that instead of taking the risk of making a phone call to his wife that he'd be late and getting trapped in one more conversation, one more hallway, uh, uh, you know, encounter he would just get out of there and get in his car and get home as quickly as he could arriving about 15-20 minutes late home when he arrived, his wife was first relieved that he was home, but then her relief, her joy, quickly turned to anger and outrage because he was late. And she had no idea where he was. She was wondering if he was in an accident. She was wondering if he was dead. How long does she wait before she starts calling the hospitals? On and on it went as she unloads on her husband, how dare he be late and not let her know. And, and unleashes this tirade on his tardiness. Well, this was a difficult spot for their marriage. And there were a few of those types of encounters that just seemed a little, that her response didn't seem to quite match the offense. 
and their marriage was going through a tough spot over it, and so they decided to look for help and, and dig into this a little bit, and a counselor helped her to realize that when she was young, her father had abandoned her and her family. And it was one of those kinds of things where he went to the grocery store and never returned. And so her entire childhood and, and even into her adulthood, she was growing up and, and, and had these incredible feelings of hurt and abandonment and fear that at any time it could happen again. And how interesting that because of what her father had done, she was taking it all out on her husband. And that's what our baggage causes us to do. Eliab is burning with anger against David because he talked to the soldiers. But he wasn't really angry with David. Instead, he had other baggage in his life, in his heart, that he was dealing with. What does it take to discover your baggage and to try to deal with it more effectively? I want to suggest to you that it's absolutely essential for you to do that difficult work. You have to figure out what is the baggage that is keeping you from overcoming the giants in your life. What is it that's causing you to, to, to react certain ways, to make decisions in certain ways, to lead a life that you're leading? If you want to live happier and healthier and more successful in areas of your life, if you want to just do a better job in your marriage, as you parent, with co-workers, maybe being braver in the world around you, if you want to live a better life, you have to be able to discover your baggage, identify it, and work on unpacking it from your life. Or else it will continue to keep us hiding from the kind of person that God wants us to, to be. Have you ever looked at someone else and had that kind of thought? You may, have not, may or may not have called it baggage or thought about it that way, but you do know their baggage is so obvious. You've, you, you've witnessed people around you. You've, you. you've seen them and you've had that thought to yourself where, where you just wish they could see themselves the way they're talking, the way they're acting, the things that they're doing, the clothes that they're wearing. Oh, my lanta. Have <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you ever looked at someone else and thought, I wish I had a, a tape recorder. I wish I had a video camera. I wish I could play this back to them and they could see. How, how, they, how they act, how they respond, how they, they do this, how they live, what they sound like, what they look like, so they could see it, they could hear it. Um, take a break, though. If you're sitting next to your spouse, go ahead and turn to them and say, but honey, I never had that thought about you. Okay. <laughs> let, let them know they're off the hook. That, yeah, other people. I've had that about other people. I've seen it around. Never you. But if you've ever had that thought about some other person, guess what? Somebody has probably had that thought about you. Somebody has probably thought that about you. You see, we all have blind spots. We, we, have, thing, we have things that we do, the ways that we act that, that we don't recognize. We don't realize. We don't see the damage it's doing to the relationships in our life. We don't see how it might even be keeping us from a relationship with God. It's interesting by the very definition, the, the idea of a blind spot is something that you think you're good at when in fact you're completely unaware that you have a problem with it. When I looked up this idea of a blind spot, the first thing I found was a blind spot test and, and I thought it would be a questionnaire but it was actually a visual test. And it was rather interesting that in the back of your eye, where, your, uh, where the optical nerve attaches to your eye, there's no photosensors there. 
and they are placed in the rest of the eye. So in the very back of your eye, you have a place in your eye where it, can't, where it doesn't have any visual signals going to the brain. Now our brains are so amazing that it takes all the information around us and it extrapolates over that black spot. And so you see, I'm seeing less these days, but you basically see the world around you as it is. You basically see all the colors, you see all the, 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 the shapes, you see, you see everything around you, and you don't have much in the way of, of any black spots. Well, this little visual test has a way of revealing the black spot, and there's a little black dot that moves. And if you look at it a certain way, you do this just right, as it comes across, what happens is the black spot disappears for like a half a second, and then it comes back as it moves through the pathway of that blind spot that everyone has. What an interesting analogy that in our lives, all of us live with blind spots. There are things in our lives, there are ways that we act, there are things that we do that are making great impact on people around us. Um, and you are, comp you are probably completely unaware of how damaging it is. At the recent leadership conference I went to about a month ago, one of the speakers was talking about blind spots and my ears were perking up and he said the average person has 3.4 blind spots. Um, I probably have less and you guys make up the average so that's why it's a 0.4. Um, <laughs> yep, yep, I'm sure that's it. Um, but since then, and especially going through this series, I've been trying to do some work on discovering what my blind spots are. Can I be just momentarily transparent? He shared an example, and it just really spoke to me. I tend to think of myself as someone that handles stress pretty well. I tend to think of myself as, you know, fairly happy-go-lucky, usually pretty up, um, usually see the bright side, usually optimistic. Um, I don't get angry very easily, and I don't get angry very often. Um, I don't think that I overreact when I am confronted with a situation. And when I have to deal with confrontation, even though I hate it, um, I, I think of myself as one that doesn't lash out and doesn't, uh, you know, use anger and ridicule and, and different things. Uh, you know, tools. I think of myself that handles this stuff pretty well. However, as I've been reflecting on this further, I realize that I'm extremely uncomfortable with confrontation. Um, I tend to carry my stress much closer to the surface than I am often willing to admit. And one of the things that I recognize, one of the areas that I'm noticing more and more that it comes out is is when I'm driving. <laughs> and you know, you know how um, there's some streets around the area. There's one right here up at the end of Crestline when it goes across Francis. And there's two lanes, and just across the street, it converges into one. Now, everyone knows the left-hand lane is the lane you're supposed to be in if you're going to go straight. <laughs> And you could go be in that lane, you could be parked at that light, and somebody is going to come up beside you, not to turn, but to try to cut you off. <laughs> and get in my lane <laughs> ahead of me. And when I see it coming, man, I grab my driving gloves, I shift it down, I take a hold of the wheel, they are not going to beat me in my my little three cylinder orangey car <laughs> 0 to 60 in 5.3 minutes <laughs> and it just makes me so mad I'm so angry with that what are they thinking you know there's other but there's other areas in my life too where I actually don't deal with problems as well as I should. And it's a blind spot in my life. How about you? What are you doing to discover 
your blind spots, your baggage, the areas in your life. So I said next time we'll talk about some more specific areas. We'll go a little bit further in the story. Um, but maybe for now, you know, continue some of the work we've talked about before. And I'll just give you one little teaser or one little piece of, of work that you might start writing down some thoughts. Is there, a, is there an account or an issue or something from my past that is still impacting me and affecting me today? Or are there areas in my life where I see that I'm struggling and ask the question, why? Or you might ask for somebody to help you with this, with this process. What do you see in me that I need to know? But what are you willing to do? What would you be willing to do to discover the baggage in your life so that you could step into a new life, into a new future that doesn't create the kind of collateral damage